Good, so hopefully everyone clicked okay for recording for posterity. Do you want to say anything, Colin, or should I just launch in? Um, yeah, I'll just say, you know, I mean, I'm really excited for this, um, this event and uh, it kind of got brought up to us from by, by Denny actually has been helping out with, with some of the group stuff um, that, you know, the, uh, the, the whole NFT phenomenon is something that's really happening right now. It's immediate. And um, she brought up, you know, the idea of maybe putting a show together. And I thought immediately of Anne, since she's kind of the uh, authority within the group on, on the topic. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with the way that the, the show has turned out. I think that uh, she did an amazing job curating and, and her uh, assistant Phil also helped, I believe, with the install and everything. I think it looks great. And, uh, you know, all the uh, the artists, um, some of whom I was familiar with and some of who, whom I'm not. So I'm interested in seeing what everyone has to say. And I'll, I'll pass the mic over to Ann. My, my name's Colin, by the way. I'm going to talk more about Colin, too. Uh, so I'm Ann Spalter. Some of you I've been corresponding with over email and various social media. Um, I'm the curator of the show. I'm also an artist who has been doing digital artwork for several decades now and recently began making NFTs. And I'm also a collector of digital art. And with Michael Spalter, we have a now pretty large collection of especially early digital artwork, which you can see at spalterdigital.com. And I'm gonna talk about the inspiration for the show and give a quick tour of it, a very quick tour since there are so many pieces. And then um, wonderfully, most of the artists RSVP that they would be here at some point during the opening. So as you go through, if there are pieces and artists that you wanna know more about, definitely um, we'll have some conversation in the video chat and then also in the textual chat on the side. So um, store up your questions for video after my little spiel or just ask them anytime you want in the chat and we will get to them. Um, we're doing the opening over Zoom, but I'll be demoing or going around the show in the 3D Kunst Matrix space, but there's no chat function in that space. So that's why there are the two different kind of platforms going at the same time. Um, I was inspired to do this show because I'm, I'm a student of the history of digital art, and I became interested in the responses people were having to these NFTs. I began making some, selling some, I thought they were great, and um, I was surprised at all the negativity that started coming up in the New York Times in major art press and with people saying that um, many negative things, uh, the, the, the art was bad art, it was kitsch. And some of the things reminded me of all the reading I had done about uh, early computer artwork. And for instance, a quote from 1991 that's in Grant Taylor's amazing book, when the Machine Made Art, The Troubled History of Computer Art, um, a journalist wrote, in general, artists from the mainstream held a common disdain for computer art shows, seeing them as science fiction grotesqueries masquerading as art, which could literally have been a quote from any article about the Beeple NFT or many of the things going on today. And that was literally 30 years ago. So I kind of felt like I'd seen this movie before and maybe I could help shift how, how the ending would be. And I knew from the history of computer art that having well curated shows really helps educate people, curators, um, art lovers, and other artists about what's possible for a field. So I felt like it was very important, if I could, to um, try to contribute one of those and let everyone know that there was a lot of really great NFT artwork out there. So, um, it's not just that I contacted a lot of traditional artists I knew who were great and through the call for entry took in people who made good art and then had them, you know, scan it in and make it an NFT. The artwork is really pieces that either were made specifically for the blockchain or if they were based on other work, commented on the blockchain technology and the crazy digital world that we live in. So um, I want to... And I'm going to give my thanks first and then I'll share my screen and start doing the tour. I want to thank um, Colin Goldberg, who is the founder of this whole Texpressionist movement and the coiner of the phrase Texpressionism and helped um, support this entire show and responded to countless requests for uh, website changes at all hours of the day and night. 
and my studio manager, Phil Shaw, who did the incredible layout of the works in the Kunst Matrix space, which you'll see, um, and the Kunst Matrix platform, which has been sponsoring to expressionism and offering this really um, beautiful space for installation of the show and to all the artists, all the artists who applied at all. And I know as an artist myself that applying to shows takes time and money and energy. And um, there was more great artwork than I could accommodate in the show, but I'm thankful to everyone who did apply. And most of all, to the artists that are in the show and who have been working with me now for several weeks, going back and forth and ironing out all of the many details required to get the show together. It's been a really great experience to work with everyone. So I'd love to share my screen and I'm gonna close Discord first and then just share everything. Desktop. Um, I think this will share everything. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing my whole screen or just my desktop? Desktop. Just desktop. All right, let's try again. Let me share. All right, I'm sharing Chrome. I think there is something where you can share everything, but Chrome should be good for now. Um, okay, so you, do you see now the show? To expression, this is what you see when you land on the to expressionism page and you can enter into the show. Yes. And you can see all the artists and click on the essay that I wrote and view online catalog of all the works. I'm actually gonna go into the show from the Kunst Matrix page because I think the navigation works a little bit better that way. Um, kind of kind of explain the navigation as we go through and do just a really quick tour saying literally one or two sentences about each piece. And I know um, all of you, you know, are artists are in the art world and are probably used to going through shows and looking very quickly at things because you're used to the medium or the genre and you can take it in very fast. And I think for this type of show, you really need to spend time with each work to understand what it's about. So even though they also look great superficially, there's just a lot of depth to each piece. So I'm going to give a little sound bite for each one, but you'll see that they also have more information for exploring them. And as I said before, a lot of the artists are here as well to talk more about the pieces. And I'm happy to answer questions as well, of course. So we're in this cool 3D space and I'm going to back up. It's basically a big rectangle with a skylight and a cool platform in the middle, and then work all around on all the walls and sides of everything. You can navigate back and forth with your mouse and side to side, and you can also do that with the little buttons on the bottom. So it's pretty easy to navigate. That's all the navigation. And I'm gonna do a combination of 3D navigation and the guided tour so that you don't get seasick or have to put up with my poor 3D navigational skills. So I'm going to start out right here with Snow Foo's work, which is about relationships and technology and coming together and disintegrating in this beautiful dance. And then just proceeding and you'll, this is going to go at quite a clip, but we can go into anything in more depth if people want afterward. Um, Jonathan Paul, also known as Desire Obtain Cherish, has this cool piece of backup to make the animations work when you get close to a piece. So you'll see a still image. And then when you're within a certain distance, you'll see the animation go. And this is in the tradition of text-based work like Jenny Holzer. Everything you know is wrong seemed very appropriate to me for NFTs, plus it's super beautiful. So it had um, resonated with me in a lot of ways and seemed appropriate for the show. My own work with Josh Craig, who did the music, commenting on AI, which was used with the control tower and the built environment and a kind of threatening sci-fi feeling. Tommy Mintz's automated photography, calling on a tradition of sometimes sound doesn't go off in this, which can be a little bit annoying. I may have to reload it, in fact. Stand by. Sometimes you pull away from a piece, but the sound keeps going, which I think they're still kind of working on the Kunst Matrix platform. But um, 
he stands in one place and has multiple photos and then the computer puts them all together. So it's a combination of an old tradition of photography and new computational photography traditions as kind of where we are in digital space and time. Uh, Clive Holden's cool series Internet Mountains and this is actually based on one of the oldest known color photographs and now it's in the super modern NFT world and has these kind of flying focus circles on it. So now we're going along the back wall just to pull out so you can see where we are in that big rectangle with uh, Amber Kelly's piece which has like commentary on still life and it's sort of a understated disarming piece that comments on the whole NFT scene with tulipomania being its subject matter. Bro, which I instantly fell in love with, which is Alicia's piece who's here and I'm hoping that crypto bro definitely buys this work. One of Andy Thomas's beautiful bird pieces based on recordings of bird sounds in Australia and also observations of the forest there and it's a strange sort of mysterious compelling nature meets technology melange with uh, also this neon coloring in it really beautiful and when you um, click through to the NFT you can see other works of his that are animated as well and have bird sounds in them. Devante's Basquiat inspired skull piece just super energetic drawing and I feel like if Basquiat had been alive now he would definitely be making NFTs. So I'm going to pull back now first so you can kind of see where we are. It will let me. So we just turned around and we're looking at the wall behind where we were. And this is one of the first pieces using algorithms and sort of computational um, ways of creating artwork by Tyler Hobbs, who's been doing this kind of artwork for a long time. And he writes software that draws on abstract expressionist kind of art feeling, which was of course very appropriate for expressionism, which is inspired by that art historical period and having the brush strokes um, and feeling of kind of Helen Frankenthaler and brush stroke feeling of Lichtenstein. So calling on these old art periods, but really updated for this new NFT digital art period. And I think also he, he puts a lot of work into the color palettes and computational color and gets very beautiful results. Kate McDonald's super uh, weird, mysterious, nature and technology uh, pieces that are sort of garden detritus and then they have little bird and uh, other kind of natural forms in the middle. You're not sure quite what you're looking at, but it's very strange and a little bit disarming. System, this is a happyocracy. I am a magnet for success. I am a magnet for success prosperity. 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 and prosperity. So all kinds of things that he found on the internet and put into this joyful but critical melange. Let's see if we can go to the next one without. All right, we're going to go back actually so that we can um, escape from the sound and then just navigate around. Whoops. Escape from the sound and then navigate around. Careful not to trigger any other sounds. Get to the next piece. Awesome. Alexandra Spicer's piece. And these are a whole series of useless armaments. Uh, the whole title is Useless Weapons, Machine Dreaming. And she put a whole bunch of guns into an AI program and made all these things that are recognizable as weapons, but obviously couldn't be fired. So they're, um, you know, a commentary on gun violence and artificial intelligence and uh, also kind of weird and beautiful in their own way. Patrick Lichty's 7,000 Oaks, which is a reference to Joseph Boyce's 7,000 Oaks. His are 7,000 Oaks do not exist. And they are created with AI and comment as Boyce did on energy and conservation. Um, in this case, on the energy uses of NFTs. Mm -hmm. 
hard to navigate around the sound, a little bit tricky. Um, David Young, who also is known as Triple Code, just started this really cool series of works based on quantum computing, something I understand zero about. But um, this is based on the decay of qubits in a quantum computer. And I like his thesis was that you can understand a little bit of the science. You don't have to be a quantum physicist to make artwork about a cool technological topic. And he takes data from this quantum decay and makes it algorithmically into these series of beautiful artworks. <laughs> I don't know yet. Let me take a look at the page. Escape from sound for a minute. Um, use the actual hash identity of the transaction on the Ethereum blockchain to design the piece. So he takes his own cloud photos, and then all the animation is based on the actual transactions of the piece. And so they're very beautiful and informed by their own technology. And the music is also generated from the hash. And then okay. we're going to navigate by hand here because of the sound, but I know the next piece is on the platform. And when you're in this space and you want to get up on the platform, you can't leap up onto it. You actually have to go up the stairs, which might require us going backward. for your patience with my poor 3D navig. I'm bad at 3D navigation in real life too. Okay, here we go. You can use the keys as well on the keyboard. What? The keys on the keyboard, I think you can navigate with as well. Yeah, or you can click onto the, the piece directly and it'll, it'll pull you into it. You have to get to the bottom of the stairs. There we go. To get up onto the platform. Boom. Okay, now we're up there. And now we can do the next buttons. So Aaron Coe's um, cool piece, Anubis, is actually an AR activated work. And if you buy it, you get a physical art object. All the works have a link where you can go and see them on the platform that they're minted on. And I'm gonna go to this one because she put the actual AR effect on it so you can see how cool it will be. We have to come back to it. Come back to it in a second. I think it's playing now. Nope, I think that's something else playing the other side of the wall. Okay, uh, which is Al Flores' piece, which is based on real photography and just capturing these beautiful transcendent moments of light on traditional film brought into the NFT world. We go see a little bit of the simulation by John Simon, inspired, as you might have recognized, by uh, Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie. And he actually programs stoplights and collision detection in, so the cars are obeying all these rules and going around. And I felt like it had a lot of the same energy as the painting. Uh. We go. Simon Demis, piece Spectron 228 is one of a large number of Spectrons. I think there's 600. And these are, um, this and the next one are two pieces from a company called artblocks.io, which has been helping artists release algorithmically created work that gets minted on demand. So the artists create the code, and you can see the general family of work and the style of it, and you buy it, but you don't know what it will look like until it's actually minted. So it's kind of fun. It's a little bit surprising as you don't know exactly what you're going to get. And as a collector of early digital art, I feel like it has sort of direct ancestry to the very first um, works of computer art, which were almost all algorithmically generated. 
So um, this beautiful piece is based on early audio and digital synthesizer and video tools. And there's a more complete description of how those things relate to each other within the piece. And Jeff Davis, who's actually the COO now, I believe, of Artblocks, did a large series of color theory works. And he's actually written a book on color theory. So they're all different, all really beautiful. And Sue Bayer's work, which also has beautiful color, has a completely different process. Um, she's Australian, and they're based on famous landscape Australian paintings. Ab the colors are abstracted, and she animates them, so they're this kind of interesting in-between space of abstraction and representation, and the old and the new. All the awesome, awesome artists in the show. Collins work. The sound from NASA, Discovery. So if you've seen any of his 2D work, it is very three-dimensional, but I love the way the layers get pulled apart and then the sound is really terrific as well. It adds a whole um, crazy energy to it. Let's see if we can go to next without sound. We were able to. Um, Carter Hodgkin is known for doing wonderful pieces based on cloud chambers and the movement of subatomic particles, particles visualized in cloud chambers. And this is an example of that type of piece. Each pixel is like one of the little uh, subatomic particle paths. And it's based on a larger work that I believe is installed somewhere. Uh, Pinder Van Armen's work is super innovative. This you might recognize as a CryptoPunk, which is one of the first series of things ever sold as NFTs on the Ethereum blockchain. And he's actually developed his own robotic painting system that um, he programmed and physically built. And it's a robot painting of a CryptoPunk. So many meta levels of NFT commentary there. Uh, Maja Calogera's beautiful painterly piece entitled Emil and Joan Go Out for a Beer. And I just found this mesmerizing. I think you kind of go inside this and it's like entering one of those living painting immersive 3D shows that are so popular now. This piece was actually in the last Techspressionism show as well, Ross Diamond and Megan. I only know her last name is Ete, but Etessa Bian, I hope I'm not totally butchering that. And they work together inspired by the Never Surrender, uh, Surrender Dorothy phrase from the movie The Wizard of Oz and their response was never surrender. So it was sort of a, a feminist approach to the movie and a collaborative artwork from the East and the West. A little blurb taken out of the essay. Another algorithmic piece and unlike almost all early computer artwork and even most algorithmic artwork today, it's not a bunch of rectilinear things and lines and exact colors. Um, it's based on paintings. So it's actually based on Jeremiah's oil paintings and they're all sliced and diced and then non-deterministically, uh, randomly reassembled with some of that random information coming from the transaction hash of the person who's purchased it. So the buyer actually influences the outcome of the piece. So it's kind of surrealism and algorithmic artwork together. Ectodorpha, which it took me forever to realize is a backwards spelling of Aphrodite and is inspired by a science fiction book of that same name, which is about transcendence and psychedelia and uses Sean Mick's custom animation software that he wrote. Coco Dali's uh, work where she combined her own drawings and pinup models and the sculpture of Nick de saint Fal as a kind of a comment on patriarchy and feminism. And now we're zooming up oh, back to the beginning. So that that was the whirlwind whirlwind tour. I'm going to stop my screen share. And I guess let me know if People have questions for me. I will hang out till at, um, around 7 p.m. and we can answer questions in chat and over video.
you know, I just wanted to say it was it's a great show, excellent show. Really enjoyed the tour going through. Thanks so much. Th it's hard to talk about so many great works quickly, but I didn't want to blab on for an hour, you know. But if anyone has more questions about anything specific, or you know, let me. Know. Yeah, I I have a question. Is there is there um in the NFT work uh, work that you've seen, you know, um in the boom, yeah, you know, in the last couple of months. Oh, Giovanna, what? Giovanna, your work is here. Hold on, maybe we oh, missed yeah. the wall. Hold on, maybe um we were tweaking. Uh, don't want. We were tweaking the numbers, and it is possible that somehow in paging through everything, a wall. But do not fear, Giovanna, because your work is in the show. You uh, could pull up a list of works with that little eye icon too, I think and then I jump saw directly it to it. Uh, There's a bunch more. Oh, okay. Can people hear me? Yes. All right, I've turned the sound off from, from my browser. There is a whole wall that somehow we didn't see with the numbering and I apologize. And let's see it right now because there's awesome artwork on it. Um, Liu Shi or Shu, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it with sensory overload with how we are connected to machines and combined with machines. And I thought it was um, really well expressed with this overwhelming amount of yellow and obviously the combination of the head inside the machine. And this is part of a whole series that's on his website. Uh, Matthew Plummer Fernandez with cave paintings based on his own neural network um, projections of images onto caves, which obviously is, you know, sort of Plato updated for the NFT world. And they're also very fanciful. Uh, to me, they also kind of look like they're underwater, which is fun. And Giovanna, your awesome work, based on an Italian love song and a beautiful, surrealistic, dreamy environment. And you can hear the whole story, uh, read about the whole story of the love song, but it's very sweet, a little bit sad. And um, Linda Bahar's work, which is based on traditional printmaking and ideas about standardization of women's bodies. And I'm going to put my sound back on. Hopefully here. Yes. So, and uh, made into a clock. So more standardization with timekeeping and just brought uh, a lot of things together. I thought in a really successful way, printmaking, animation, NFT, and the, and the concepts. All right, I think that I think that is everybody. Apologies for skipping that wall. Oh, Erin, I had your animation up. Oh, it wasn't loading. Let me go back again and see if it loaded in. Time out. Try again. Okay, it is here. And here is Erin's beautiful animation. So this is the, these are the cool AR effects that you will see if you get the piece. And then there's an app that you'll be able to download on your phone. And when you look at the artwork, you'll have this transcendental um, future, but retroactive sci-fi experience. And how many submissions do have all together? Hang on, I'm gonna share the sound in the AR. There was sound there, I think, because I turned off the sound in my, yeah, my sound is on. Oh, here we go. All right, I'm not sure why it's not showing the sound, but you should all go into the show and when you click through to the NFT, you'll hear the sound, which I am not sure why Chrome is not playing right now. But it's a really cool sound. Mm -hmm. You know, my question was, how many submissions did you have all together? I'm not making it public because there were a lot. There <laughs> were a lot. It was a small percentage that I was able to accept, and there was a lot of really great work. So no one should feel badly about not being in the show. And um, 
as an artist myself, that was absolutely the most difficult part of this was having to write to people and say that they weren't in the show. So I totally feel that. Um, if there's any questions, it's hard for me to sort of answer and do questions. So I don't know, Colin or, or Davo, if there's questions that I should answer, maybe just read them for people. Oh, I've got you covered. I was actually digging through the, um, the oh. chat just for that. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And um, be like scanning at the same time. I just wanted to say, uh, it, give Davo a quick introduction. Davo oh. is our, our moderator of uh, our salons um, almost every single time, other than when he's recuperating from a COVID <laughs> shot. Um, at which point I took over last time, but um, he's he's been kind of the face of tech expressionism with our live events, and uh, yeah, so we tapped into to mod this one too. Yeah, um, that's me. Um, and my work was in the exhibition. Um, it was the Basquiat um, related work. So that's me. That's that's the kind of stuff I do. Um, but back to talking about the exhibition um and you did have a question very very early on from one of our actual tech expressionists um asking about um the kind of resistance that you know the establishment is coming with uh regarding nfts um so do you think that the resistance will resolve and are there any um, watershed moments that will hasten that the acceptance of this kind of work or is the acceptance actually kind of moot at this point? Uh, I think given the amount of money that's poured into the field, it's sort of, you know, taken off. So a little bit of it is moot, but um, I think some of the resistance was it's strange and new, kind of like early computer artwork. It's a strange technology, it's threatening. Is it really art? Where is it? Why would people pay for something that anyone can see? You know, there's a lot of questions that I asked that the first time someone told me about NFTs, I asked that same question. And I think it's a, a natural question. It takes a while to kind of get in it and get used to the idea of it. And then you start to say, oh, like now I understand it more and it makes more sense to me. But I think it's natural to at first be a little bit puzzled by it and wonder about the whole crypto thing. I think there are some legitimate technical concerns about how the art images are actually stored and where they're stored and how their longevity can be um, really secured forever, you know? So maybe some of the guarantees aren't as technologically certain as they might sound, but I'm very hopeful that there will be technological solutions to things like that and the energy usage problem that is currently a big problem with the Ethereum blockchain. So I think some of the concerns are, are real and do need to be dealt with. Some of them are more psychological and just people need to get to learn more about it and to become more accustomed to it. Um, there is another question that was from early on. And um, I know maybe not everyone in this room is actually familiar with NFTs insofar as it is a thing that's happening. So Anne, if, you, um, if you'd like, would you go ahead and explain just like the general process of what kind of goes into with creating an NFT? Sure. It, it's essentially you're making a certificate of authenticity that is stored as a token on this thing called the blockchain, which is a big digital ledger that's keeping track of stuff for you. So you have this certificate and it's related to the image of your artwork, which is actually stored somewhere else, which is a cause of some consternation for people. So um, the you make it by uploading your image to one of the platforms like super rare rareable or known origin you pay some money in cryptocurrency like ethereum and they mint it for you so they make it into a token on the blockchain and then people can see it and and buy it and sell it um that it's hard to explain it in a lot of detail in a short period of time but i think that's the gist of it I think that does cover it. Um, we have another question um, from Michael Spalter. Um, can you please discuss the role of women in the show yeah, <laughs> and the historic I, underrepresentation? I had put on the call for entry, I said women strongly encouraged to apply because there had been a lot of um, stuff on social media about how NFTs were dominated by these crypto bros and it was a male dominated space. and 
I thought, you know, there must be women out there. But in fact, without any special effort on my part, almost half the show is women. I think there are actually just a lot of really great women artists that have been attracted to this space and that it's another parallel with early computer art. And my theory is that because it is a new area that is in fact not dominated by anyone because it's so new, that women are encouraged to come into it and feel like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go into it because it's, it's wide open, it's available to anyone. There's also the added um, factor with, with NFTs that a lot of the people are anonymous and that's sort of a, a feature of the crypto world where I don't know, they're, they're tax laundering or whatever it is, but um, some of the big name collectors, you, you can't tell who they are, but you can post your work and people don't know you're a man you're a woman they don't know your race your gender your sexual preference and in a way that's kind of nice like you put up the work and people can look at the work and decide to buy it based on whether they like the work and not use any other information so i think that's actually a really positive aspect of the field um, in addition to having a pretty equal balance of men and women there are also artists from all over the world in the show and again, even though it, the call for entry was in English on an English site, um, we had applications from everywhere. So I think because it's on the internet and it's a web storefront, you know, um, for selling things, it's open 24 hours a day on like a gallery in a certain city or something. It, it's perfect for international participation and community. All right. Uh, uh, there's actually quite a few questions or different questions peppered throughout the chat. Um, there's one here I from. You can't hear me, only music, but. Yeah. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay, I shouldn't. Yeah, I could hear you. The music that's playing on my thing. Okay. Yeah, so we can hear you. Okay, cool. Okay, um, scrolling back up, I think there was a question from Linda. Um, asking about, um, she, they had a question about uh, copyright of the NFT owner versus the physical, um, if it's like a physical work, the physical video or the physical piece of artwork, like how, how would the copyright work in that kind of equation? I'm not totally sure I understand the question, but when you sell the NFT, as long if you're not selling anything with it, there's pretty much no copyright that goes with it. The only thing that you are selling is the ability for someone else to sell that thing. So they don't have um, the right to reproduce or um, display, although obviously it's on the web, it's already displayed, but they can't go for instance and make prints of your work. They can't go and make videos of your work and sell it at an art fair. So they don't have you know, any of those copyrights. They don't go with the piece unless that's specifically added on there which um, if any of you were following what was happening with the uh, Basquiat NFT, um, that's whole the mess where they were uh, talking about potentially destroying the original piece and just so that the NFT owner could have the only instance of it. The, the actual copyright owners came down and said, no, you can't do that. That's not a thing. That wasn't like the copyright wasn't conferred with the NFT purchase. So no, you can't do that. There's also something called moral rights, which has been a thing forever in Europe. And now there are some in the US that no matter what legal documents you sign, you're actually not allowed to destroy artwork. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Interesting legal issues. Yeah. And they're probably going to get a lot more interesting and complex as time goes on and uh, new case scenarios pop up. And it's like, oh, we didn't think about that at first. Um, but yeah, that's, that's part of being in an emerging field. Yeah, I see the erase de Kooning being mentioned, but, uh, <laughs> by Gary, but they agreed to that. I mean, they, both those artists knew what was going on. Um, we did have a question from Patrick. Um, he said, in the work that you've seen in the NFT boom, what themes are you seeing emerge? Um, I think it's such a vast area. So one of the problems and, and challenges has been an art critic will go online and, and take kind of a, a look across a few platforms and say, oh, it's all, you know, drawings of outer space or it's all 3D renderings of women. And it's hard to look at the whole thing and say that there's a theme because there's so many people involved. And uh, Jason Bailey, who's been writing on this 
topic for a long time said, you know, the, um, the blockchain, it's, it's an underlying technology and it's being used for artwork. So it's a little bit like saying you can buy artwork with a credit card, credit card artwork is bad. <laughs> you know, be, you can buy a lot of different artwork with a credit card. You can buy a lot of different visual content on the blockchain. Some of it is fantastic artwork. Some of it is crap. There's everything in between. So it de really depends where you go and look. All right. And we have another, we have a question from John Miller, who's um, says, I've noticed a lot of the artwork has some form of animation. Is this the main format that is available in the NFT sphere? Uh, no, you can put anything up there. So you can have a still image, an animated image, video, you can have sound with it. Um, on some sites, you can now have interaction as well, which is really exciting. I think because it's living on the internet, it kind of does encourage multimedia work that is hard to show and sell in other contexts. So, you know, as a, an artist selling new media, if you have um, a work with sound and animation and it's hard to, you have to have a screen in your house or you have to have sound that's on in your living room. There's a lot of issues with it out in the traditional art world that just aren't factors with NFT. So I think uh, people are sort of encouraged by the medium to do that type of work. Sort of just happens naturally. Um, looks like, doo -doo -doo -doo. okay. So that question's already been taken care of because that was directed at the artist in question. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Nagin wants to know if we sold an art piece before, could we make an NFT of it? Yeah, um, legally, absolutely, yes. It's been an interesting issue for me as an artist, whether I would do that. And then also when I sell an NFT to someone, I've started offering prints with them and I'm about to do a print sort of NFT combo series. So I sort of feel personally like they should be kept together, but there is no reason why you can't separate them. Absolutely. Oh, we got a question from Roz. Are most of the works you curated digitally created online? And can you please speak to how the NFT space speaks to digitally created works versus traditionally made works, like an oil painting? It gives governance, yet. Yeah. I mean, provenance, sorry. Provi it gives provenance, yes. Um, Be the last question in the chat. What is the question? I mean, all the works came to me digitally, but some of them started life with in a traditional format, you know? And I think the whole spectrum. So some are literally traditional works that were minted, but that made sense, you know, um, in terms of the content and theory of the work. Some started as traditional things and then went through some sort of process like the surrealistic algorithmic, you know, paintings that are recombined. Some were entirely digital, done on the computer and then minted as NFTs. So I think really the, the whole range is out there. Um, and can I just pop in here and reiterate what I was sort of talking about? Yeah. Hard to put in the questions and yeah. sometimes, but um, type it in. I guess one thing that's really interested me, and I wonder if, if you have anything to say about it, is that as someone who's been creating digitally for so long, um, you know, that whole idea of like, oh, well, there's so many out there. Uh, why should we buy an NFT? And the fact is, you know, the resolution of a piece and the way you make it and the size of it and all of that is part of the provenance of the piece that seems to me now as a digital artist, if I say you're getting number three of 10 of something and it's this resolution and that size, that's very different. Like you, you can buy a postcard of the Mona Lisa, but you're not getting the, you know, it's not the same as the physical Mona Lisa. And for a digital artist, when you buy or and I'm saying, uh, you know, creating something within the digital space, um, when it's going through digital currency in the blockchain, the provenance it's given that that person owns that actual code of that work at that size and resolution. I mean, I, I don't know. I find that for me, I find that so exciting. And I wonder if it's something that you think about or could comment on. Yeah. I mean, it gives you a chance to say, here's the version that's authentic to me. And then also some platforms allow you, or you can just put 
in your description of the work that you're adding extra content that can be unlocked with the purchase. Yes. So sometimes someone could buy a piece that's video, but then they can also unlock a higher resolution version of it and have that as well. Thanks. Yeah. I just thought it for people who are coming into the space for the, the first time, <laughs> trying to help them understand why it's so meaningful in a way, in a new way for artists. And I think um, whatever happens with, with the blockchain and everything, it's just been exciting that the conversation is now, um, is people real artwork? And it has shifted from, is digital art real art? to a whole other suite of questions. So it's kind of great for those of us that have been doing digital artwork for so long to have that question suddenly seem to be answered in the <laughs> yes. positive. And so I think whatever happens with NFTs, it's been a huge help for digital artists and new media artists. Can I be a double Thanks for a great show, it's fabulous. Thank okay. you. Can I be a doubles advocate to some degree? Yes, I, oh yes, Michael, yes. So, so, all my work is created digitally, but all my work is made for print. So for me, NFTs make no sense to me to create in that space. I think this, I think the exhibit is gorgeous. The work is beautiful, has integrity, but for me as an artist, NFTs would be like selling a postcard of my work because my digital work are my originals. And for me, they're, they're like the, you know, they're the underpinnings of the print work and the size that I sell at, um, that physical size is the size of the work. I don't create multiple sizes of the work, you know? And so for me, this is what's been so confounding about the NFT space has been that I create digitally, but I, but my end work is all in the physical space. So I, I still think the work is beautiful. This, this exhibit, and you've done a fantastic job curating. I, I give you all the praise for that. I think it's beautiful. Um, I think it's all great. Uh, it's just that it's been so confounding to me uh, to, to see how it feels foreign that it just isn't, I, I feel like an outsider on this part because yeah, it's, it's, it's so it's weird so because I create digitally. So it's, yeah. it's a really confounding thing for me. It's not, um, <laughs> I would never mean to say that NFTs are the end all be all. It's no, no, no. But of it, artwork. And I think there's so much hype and so much money has come into it that it might sure. seem like people are saying that, but I'd be the first to say, I, I love to see physical artwork. I can't wait to go back into a real art gallery, <laughs> the oil painting. Um, I think it's just another thing that is yeah. out there in the art world. It's not meant to take the place of physical objects at all. But, th but this, the, the exhibit is just beautiful. It really, this is really nice. Thank you. Thank you. I could do one more question and then because of my um, horrible calendaring abilities, I have to be at a, <laughs> a panel for the Rhode Island School of Design that I'm on. So I would have to duck out in a few minutes, but if there are any last questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And we're going to keep the, the reception open. So if anyone has questions for any of the artists in this show, you know, Davo and I will be here till eight and we'll stop recording at that time. And I think someone had mentioned something about royalties in here. So I think the description of NFTs, it's important to note that unlike the regular art world, most of the platforms offer a royalty percentage, usually 10% to artists. So if you sell your work and then that the person that bought it sells it again, you get 10% of that next sale and, and any other additional sales as well, which can sound minor, but but it actually happens to you. It's, it's sort of a super emotional experience and very exciting and i think um you know artists when they experience it really love it and i hope again it's another thing where even if nfts don't work out or the blockchain disappears that this will influence the traditional art world and help artists get royalties in, for all art media yeah and can i ask a question 
um, if I was buying some of the the work I, and I wanted to display it I, on my wall, I, where maybe an ordinary painting, oil, an oil painting would maybe be, if I buy an, a, a number of uh, items, can they, can they be stored on an SD card and can you, uh, can you use them you know, to display over, over the house, all of different images uh, over, the, over the home? Yeah. Uh, like uh, Wi-Fi? Absolutely. You can project you can them, that. put them on your TV. You can use video display things like Infinite Objects has these cool acrylic display screens and they'll put your mm. NFT on one and they look amazing and you can display them on that. So, and yeah. I think more companies will come up with, with NFT display devices. Yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, obviously there's some great images here. Uh, and the fantastic uh, colours, uh, but okay, you want it. You could, depending on your mood, you could change what you look at. Yeah, and, and you know. people are putting their NFTs into virtual galleries in 3D spaces like Crypto Voxels and Decentraland, so they can go mm. into virtual spaces and visit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the artists and everyone who helped make this possible. And hang out. Thank you. Out Let's give a hand for Ann. Unmute and clap. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank you, Ann. Thank you so much. Okay. Bravo. Bravo. Perfect job, Ann. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. So yeah, you know, you guys are welcome to hang out. And um, if anyone has any questions specifically for any of the artists in the show too, um, that'll give you know the artists an opportunity to respond directly if, if you guys want. Um, you could just put, them, put any questions um, in the chat, I guess. Well, Colin, I'm going to have to retire. I, it's, it's now, it's 12 o'clock here in Scotland. So um, I, I, I love the exhibition and thanks. Walter, thanks I'm for coming, Walter. My poetry friend from Scotland. All right. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Colin, what it what uh, inspired you with the audio that went with your NFT? Um, you know, it's funny, but it, it really was sort of um I mean the the approach that I take with my, my drawing that that um piece actually the digital drawing um was done in two thousand three and I have a couple NFTs up at Foundation. Ah. And what I've been doing is um, basically taking a series of work that were vector-based digital drawings that I did in Illustrator back, um, they're almost 20 years old and sort of like, you know, dug them up for this um, NFT phenomenon. And I thought, you know, because they're vector-based, they're really, um, they could be animated very easily and uh, allow the layers to like explode out and res up without any kind of loss of resolution so the the audio is really kind of like the way i approach the drawing just sort of on a very sub subconscious intuitive level something about the drawing um, made me think of barking dogs and that was kind of like the first like set of samples that i like looked for and then i was just kind of surfing around and i found these nasa samples and something about them spoke to me there was one line in one of the samples where it talked about a vector transfer. And I was like, all right, that one definitely has to go in there because it's vector-based drawing, you know? Um, and then the other sample, I think they were, they were both from the discovery missions and the other sample um, said the, the astronaut was saying something about, you know, like computers have complete control of the vehicle now or something, which is like something that, you know, for some reason, I, I just feel like, <laughs> Maybe that's just like something that I personally have been identifying with lately as I've been sort of sucked into this text expressionist vortex. But um but yeah, I really I enjoy the um the audio part. Thanks. Um we have a potential question for either Colin or Roz. Is that, are there sites you can subscribe to a gallery to a gallery of uh, as an NFT artist? Or Yeah, I I could take that. Um so um, basically, certain sites 
like um, Foundation, for instance, is a site that I've been minting um, my NFTs on, and you can follow artists on that site. Also, Anne is on Super Rare, and that also allows you to follow artists. And and some sites like um, Super Rare and Foundation function similarly to social media networks in that regard. That is, you know, they allow people to follow artists, and then every time that artist mints something, the uh, their followers get an email notification so they can bid on it and so on and so forth. Other sites um, like OpenSea um, are more like sort of a search engine for NFTs. That is, OpenSea will find anything that's minted on the Ethereum um, blockchain across all of the other uh, platforms. So like stuff that's minted on Super Rare or um, Foundation or um, Known Origin, Nifty Gateway, those all use the um, Ethereum mainnet, the Ethereum blockchain um, to, to store the information. Um, and then other, um, other platforms like um, what Davo has minted his on, um, Hicket Nunc uses a different um, cryptocurrency called Tezos uh, that uh, is a separate blockchain, but I think at some point um, probably OpenSea is going to be supporting multiple chains. I, I would imagine um, there's another um, there's another coin called Flow, which a couple different platforms use. Some of the um, some of the platforms are more like uh, almost digital collectibles, where there's something called NBA Top Shots, where it's like NBA basketball players slam dunks. And people collect and trade like videos of this, almost the way that people collect and trade baseball cards. So you can imagine the kids of the future are going to be trading these NFTs of like their sports, their sports stars. So but yeah, also you can, you can definitely subscribe to uh, you. You could follow artists, um, and and a good way to, to I think a good way to to familiarize yourself with um, the NFT world is there's, um, well, there's a document called the NFT Bible. If you search for that, it's published by OpenSea. Um, and OpenSea is to me the closest to sort of a open source or non-commercial thing, although it is commercial to some degree. Um, also, at, for artists, it allows a different business model for minting than a lot of the other platforms. That is, you pay one gas fee um, up front, and then you can mint like 100 pieces. And they don't actually get written to the blockchain until someone buys one. So you can then edit a piece, remove a piece, do all sorts of stuff. Whereas on the, the more proprietary platforms, once you mint a piece, it's on the blockchain. And the only way to remove it off the blockchain is to burn the token, which you then have to pay another gas fee for. Um, and, and the gas fee is basically um, subsidizing the work that people who are contributing to that computing network, which is the Ethereum network, um, to write the information to that blockchain. So Ethereum is actually the, the computing network and Ether is the, the actual currency. Um, for the majority of NFTs anyway. So what you're saying is that the uh, if you mint on one, you can't exchange it on another, or is there a gateway that's available that you can mint on one and send it through to another um, uh, blockchain? Yeah, if you mint on a, an Ethereum-based platform, it'll be searchable on OpenSea. So like the first, um, NFT that I minted, um, it was purchased by a collector off a of foundation, and then he almost immediately put it up for sale on OpenSea. Um, and then, you know, you when you mint something, you can set the percentage, the royalty percentage that you want to uh, receive. And the nice thing about NFTs is you really don't need to do anything to get that royalty. That is, as long as you specify the, the royalty percentage when you're minting the NFT, um, it'll automatically be transferred into the cryptocurrency wallet that you use um, or that you have associated with that platform. So um, it's, it's, it's definitely something that is favorable to, to visual artists. Um, there's also, uh, you know, with regards to that, there's a lot of transactions that could potentially happen so if you do get involved in this, I would recommend using a platform. Um, uh, well, there's a there's a there's a platform called Coin Tracker 
that um, you can sign up for through Coinbase, which is what I use to, to just purchase the initial crypto through the ETH. Um, and then Coin Tracker, what it does is you connect your wallet to it and it tracks all purchases and like all send and receive actions of any cryptocurrency that happens. So say, you know, down the road, if you decide to really get into this, you have hundreds of NFTs minted. And they're all out there floating around. People are buying them and reselling them. It would be almost impossible, you know, when you actually have to pay taxes on stuff to keep track of all that information. So something like that um, is a pretty useful tool uh, to, to automate that. Um, and yeah, 10% is, is kind of the standard. I think that a lot of platforms just like foundation, I believe just sets it at 10%. I think OpenSea, you can, um, you can specify up to 10%. Um, and then other platforms like Rarible, I think you can make it whatever you want, but they, um, their gas fees are higher than a lot of the other platforms too. And they also highly encourage you to stay in that, you know, five to 10% range. It's like, you can go above it, but mo most people probably won't uh, buy your NFT if the um, royalty is above that percentage. I mean, one other thing that I think is interesting um, about NFT culture is that most of the social media action seems to happen on Twitter um, versus uh, there have been a lot of, you know, Facebook groups and, and stuff popping up. But early on, um, it was almost exclusively on Twitter. And I think a lot of that has to do with just sort of the way that there's a, a more sort of viral propagation mechanism built into the platform from the get-go because of the ability to retweet and quote tweets. Um, whereas with, uh, it's a little bit of a different structure with Instagram and Facebook. And I think Davo had brought up a couple of salons back that like Instagram and Facebook, its parent company actually had a ban on, on content around cryptocurrency. For a minute, probably, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, but now that there are a lot of groups on Facebook, um, you know, around NFT, uh, NFT stuff. So, um, <laughs> all right um doesn't look like we currently have any more questions in the queue so i'm going to throw it out to the um, current attendants those are you there left because i think we lost about half of you in the past 20 minutes or so um does anybody else have any questions that um they want to ask or comments about the exhibition or anything at all Thoughts, feelings, Roz? Uh, thanks, Davo. Um, I thought I would just share that um, one of the, uh, I've shared this on, with Techspressionism on our salon before, but one of the interesting things I think about this experience for myself was uh, the fact that the piece I did was collaborative and might be of interest to some people who are visiting today to um, hear a little bit about that. Um, it was kind of fascinating to be reading about um, our two countries, I'm in the United States and um, Nagin is in Iran. And here we are working and collaborating uh, totally through online, through Zoom and, and making a piece together and, and having a friendship and learning about one another in this kind of openness, uh, intimate way uh, through the machine, you know, well, through the computer and making a piece that I think shares that kind of expansiveness and questioning. I mean, when you look at the pieces, it's, it's got the, the New York City skyline in the bottom and, the, and the, the, the silhouette of Iran in the top. There's a lot of little abstracts, but the point being that, you know, borders are collapsing in this medium in a way that I find so exciting from the very beginning since the 84. Um, guessing my age here, go ahead. <laughs> so, but it's been a long way, but it's been an exciting journey. And I, I love that we did that. And at the same time, I would read things in the paper about, you know, Iran has just built this and, and, and the United States is rejecting that. And, you know, all, all this sort of negative stuff about closing us in. And this medium can, can expand in a way that can be a new whole kind of renaissance of intellectual sharing and, and visual sharing. So just wanted to share that with people. Um, who are, are visiting uh, and uh, today in our salon, um, and maybe Nagin wants to say something about that too, possibly. But <laughs> thanks. 
Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, just got a question. I, I'm assuming um, you're asking about what the role uh, curators have with NFT platforms. Is, is that, am I understanding that correctly? Um, Renata? Yes. Uh, when I've looked at the different platforms, I've seen that some are a bit of a closed shop. Mm -hmm. And so they have a role. They have curators working actively to select works versus something like OpenSea where I can just go on and set up a shop. Uh, right now, like, b because everything is so new, um, the, from what I understand, most of the platforms are more or less functioning off of a, um, kind of like the, the social media viral model, like the things that get the most attention, those are the things that are going to be put at the front of, um, on the front page or what's going to be displayed first, um, on those sites. Um, also, like high profile uh, content creators like Beeple or whoever, like if, they've, if somebody else has sold something for a really high dollar amount, they'll be displayed as well at, you know, the top of a lot of the content feeds for um, these platforms. So it's, there's a level of curation um, when it comes to the, the sites themselves, but it's not as though somebody's like handpicking anything like in particular like it's not like they're gonna put, pull somebody up and they're like hey this person's obscure but their work is really good no they're going to go with people that are essentially winning by selling a whole lot or selling high dollar amounts so does that mean that there's gatekeepers in silicon valley that determine whether artists are successful or not uh let's just say the system can be gamed a little bit just like how in the traditional art space, that can also be gamed a little bit, like where you have um, collectors that are working with other collectors to keep the price of a certain work elevated just so that they can maintain their investment. So there is a little bit of that that is going on in NFT space, but it's nothing new, so to speak. Like there are, there's still, there's gatekeepers, but not to the same degree that the traditional art world still is dealing with but in order and, to get onto something like super rare you've got to be selected by a q by curators right um they there is an application process yes like they want to submit a little application i think um they're requiring some people have like a video um yeah. like a video application or video interview something like that in order to get onto the platform and again they're probably looking at things like what what how many followers does this person have on social media um, is this a real person? Because they don't want just everybody, like including bots could potentially fill out this form and apply. Um, so they're also dealing with that. Um, but it, at this time and some of these spaces, it does seem a little exclusive, like to foundation, you have to have an invite in order to get onto foundation. Um, so it's, there is a level of exclusivity and I'm pretty sure part of that is again to do with, you know, they're wanting to keep scarcity, like that scarcity mindset still in play. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's gatekeeping still a thing. I not, guess just not nearly as more, bad. <laughs> you can't have more um, artists than buyers, I guess, can you? You gotta right. keep the, yeah. So there's gotta I be think some also kind of... though, like a lot of, a lot of times, um, like the like things like um crypto punks um or the crypto kitties sort of preceded that like where they're uh a conceptual um sort of i mean you know people can look at that work and say well it's a bunch of pixelated block heads like what you know what's so special about that but i think the the sort of conceptual framework of creating this large series numbering them offering them at low prices um is a strategy that you know i mean i'm not even sure exactly who is behind um crypto punks but like it you know the people who bought them early on like um you know benefited from it. and i think a lot like there's platforms like wearable is basically an open platform but there's a lot there's a lot of commerce that happens over that and some of it is sort of like these collectibles but some of it is also actually 
legit art. You know, it's just, it's sort of a, a, you know, each platform has a little bit of a different vibe. I mean, I applied to Super Rare and Known Origin and all these ones and was just waiting around forever. And then it, and eventually connected with a guy who is a developer over Twitter just through chatting back and forth. And he's like, oh yeah, like, you know, I, I do work on foundation and he got me a foundation invite. And then I passed the ones that I got after I sold something on to a bunch of other people in the group, you know, but I think a lot of it is sort of just like, um, being active on these different social platforms and especially like, you know, I feel like the people who are involved in the development of the platforms want to attract like interesting new artists to those platforms, you know? So I feel like getting to know the, the technical, you know, sort of nitty gritty about it or getting involved with new emerging platforms is a really good way to get visibility. Um, Oh, there, um, there was somebody that actually wanted to speak on the question at hand um, about uh, the curation by Jer Policek. Yeah. yeah, that's me. Okay. I was just, um, if I could take a moment, I was thinking about that too, because what I'm doing at solos.so, right now I, we started off with my work and um, using a generative process to create these collages um, taking tangible media into the digital space. So I'm working with artists right now um, and having to bring them into this space because there's a ton of artists that don't have access to it, actually. So I think in some ways, a, a curatorial role is also kind of like a role of a producer in a way where you're working with an artist and you're, you're trying to kind of fit their practice and what they're doing into this new environment. And it's, it's really just kind of like a medium. It's, you know, it's like clay or paint or whatever you want to um, compare it to. And, you know, the way I look at it is one of bringing people in and working with them, which is kind of similar to what curators do overall. So when we're thinking about, you know, super rare or with foundation or these sort of things, you know, curators are always going to collect groups of work and create a theme, you know, like Anne did with this show in order for people to be able to read them and you know make sense of them in some sort of way. Um, so I think there's obviously like gatekeeping involved and people can get an, an invite to foundation or with foundation or whatever. But at the same time, I think there's a bigger role for small galleries to be able to come into the space and you know create their own communities, create their own discord chats, create their own communities and work with their artists to, to communicate with their buyers. And, and that's what's really missing, I think, from, uh, from the bigger picture that you know, the art establishment doesn't see. They don't get the community aspect of this. They see people you know, drawing Kim Jong-un or something like that. And they're like, what is this? It's you know, adolescent. But in reality, um, it's, it's gonna be about community. That's, that's what I think. And it's, it's just, a, it's totally ripe for, for artistic, um, exploration. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to have that kind of perspective. <laughs> um, oh, I had it. I was actually expounding on, um, I was responding to a question in the chat. Um, but um, some, some of you might have been wondering about like the gas fees associated with minting an artwork um, with Ethereum. They, they can be high, yes, and they fluctuate. And they fluctuate based off of essentially network traffic or essentially the number of transactions that are going on at any given time for minting artwork. So the higher the number of people or the, the more people that are trying to mint all at one time, pretty much the higher the price for, the higher the gas uh, fees are going to be. So it varies depending on the time of day. Early in the day, now a whole lot of people online, now a whole lot of people trying to mint, the gas fees are going to be lower. Midday, afternoon, like for most of the U.S. or most of any other part of the world, gas fees are going to be higher, probably reach their peak right around noontime or afternoon. And then it'll start to taper off a little bit as the evening goes on. Um, but the prices can like fluctuate anywhere between like maybe as low as $50 to as high as like $120. 
So that's that's the kind of range um, on any given day, pretty much, that you can be expecting to deal with uh, when minting a piece of artwork with Ethereum. Um, and uh, other than OpenSea, though. Other than OpenSea, yeah. Because um, OpenSea, it's a one-time gas fee thing, and then you can mint however much you want, which is very beginner friendly if you want to switch for NFTs. It's like yeah, I, I would just add with OpenSea, there is no ability to follow, or there isn't that social piece. You know, so you can mint stuff on there, but then it's up to you to go out there into the you know the the online world, quote unquote, and you know post that link out there and get it distributed. Yep. Uh, ba -da -da -da. One thing I noticed too is that the the price change. Maybe uh, you know we're all learning. Uh, I know I sure am with this whole NFT stuff. But I noticed that our NFT that we have in the show uh, it was originally put up as one price, but because it's in Ethereum, it, it's it's changed. You know, it's it's gotten more expensive. Actually, not not too much, but I mean quite a bit. Actually, I mean. Uh, it, we, we put it up at a bargain, two hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, I haven't sold anything for a long time, but but you know it's a new space, and I don't necessarily want to make things too high. And it is different. It's a digital piece that I haven't had to go out and frame and do things to. You know, you, they own that particular thing, but now it's three hundred sixty nine dot nineteen today, or something like that. I was like, oh wow, look at that. So I don't know. That's kind of an interesting thing. If, if anybody can speak to that. Uh, yeah, um, B or Colin. Colin, did you want to speak on it or? Uh, yeah, I mean Ethereum. Um, you know, I think it hit an all-time high today, and um, I sort of feel like, um, you know, pretty pretty bullish on Ethereum in general, just in terms of its value monetarily, but also philosophically what it stands for. I mean, a lot of these other blockchains are proprietary, so um, they're not truly, in my opinion, a blockchain at all. They're just a proprietary database owned by a company, right? So a blockchain is different because it's not proprietary, it's decentralized. And it's, you know, Ethereum is a decentralized computing network that no country has control over, you know, no board of directors has control over. There's a development team behind it. Um, but um, philosophically, it's it's very different from many other types of things, you know. And and I feel like as an artist um, working with a medium like ether as sort of the base for establishing value for work, it's it's a good thing, you know. I mean, I've sold a couple NFTs, like two, you know. But I could see that I left the ether in my wallet. And now it's worth more than it was when I sold the NFTs, which is pretty freaking cool, I think, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it also sort of stands for something really where, you know, the Federal Reserve can not just step in and say, you know what, we're going to we're going to drop the price of Ethereum today because of this new piece of legislation. Like it doesn't work that way, you know. So so I like that. And it, it will definitely fluctuate. For sure, you know, but I feel that um, like this summer Ethereum 2.0 is rolling out and that's going to supposedly, gonna really, well, yeah, maybe not this summer, <laughs> but between before they were saying this summer, now they're saying between 2022 and 2024, but right. it exists. You can, yeah. you can actually purchase, you know, you can be a stakeholder in Ethereum 2.0 yeah. and then your ether is locked into that. But I mean, it's, it's in a transition phase, uh, you know, uh, and once that becomes the norm then um the network speed is going to be a lot faster gas fees hopefully should go down etc et also the um the the model for verifying transactions is going to change too which would be addressing like some of the environmental concerns with um transaction costs right now on ethereum because right now it's apparently extremely energy inefficient and with ethereum 2.0 it's supposed to like minimize that like almost completely Supposed to. Um, oh, there was a question about um, auctions versus fixed cost for NFT artwork. Um, I haven't actually personally done any auctions. Um, the only NFT artwork I've sold has been at a fixed price. Um, 
I I'm, can't really say one way or the other about it. All, but I do know that as far as auctions go, um, one of the appeals is the fact that, you know, it's it's kind of triggering the scarcity mindset for people when they're buying something. Where it's like, hey, you only have this period of time to buy this thing. And if it's an addition of one of one, and it's, you know, after that, it's get, just going to go to the highest bidder, that, that's it. Um, whereas, you know, if you're dropping something that, you know, it's just going to be perpetually that price, um, people are going to look at the value of it a bit differently. Not to say that it's like any less, but, you know, it's kind of like the idea that, hey, I can come back to this at any time and it'll still be there. This other thing, though, is going to be gone. So usually you'll see very high dollar um, NFT sales happen because of auctions, because of that whole mentality of, hey, this is going to go away and you only have this, this opportunity, this time frame to buy this. Um, so the thing with that, though, is that if you don't have the proper marketing or you don't have, you know, the eyes on your work to, you know, have interested buyers for it, you might end up like, like making way less than what you would have if you had just sold it for a flat rate. Because I have seen that happen where, you know, somebody um, wanted to auction off a piece of work and it went through the entire period with one bid and that one bid was for like next like $50. It would have been like $50 USD. And they were like, oh, well, I can't, I can't do this. And so they actually just rejected the bid and then tried it again. I think they tried it like three times. Like they put it up for auction like three times and never got like over a hundred dollars for it as a offer. So it's like. Yeah, I'm going to add thing. to that. Like OpenSea is a really good place to experiment with that because at any time you can, um, you know, you can edit, you can edit the work or delete it without burning the token. So you could try out a bunch of different things without committing in the same way that you would on other platforms where you're actually, you know, writing it to the blockchain, you're, you're minting it for real. That is like at the time of purchase, the work on OpenSea is minted to the blockchain. But prior to that, it's searchable within OpenSea's database. So like, um, you know, and, and it's confusing too, because some sites offer the ability to mint editions, right? So it's like, well, what's, what's the point of that, you know? And then other sites use the terminology of an open edition, which in the print world means it's essentially a poster on really nice paper, right? <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but an, a, an open edition on Nifty Gateway is, we'll mint as many as we can in like an hour. And then after that, it's done. You know what I mean? So, and I didn't understand that. Like we had a speaker come on, on one of our tech expressionist salons um, who, who did a collaboration with, with Sophia, this, this humanoid robot. Right. And he said, well, we did one singular piece and we did, and he dropped it on Nifty Gateway for an insane amount of money. Like uh, I think the drop was like $1.3 million over the course of the drop and one piece sold for around 700,000. And a lot of it had to do with the fact, I guess, that it was a collaboration with this robot that was developed at Hanson Robotics. But he talked about um, the the fact that there was a an open edition, you know, as part of it, and that was confusing to me because you know it it means a different thing, I guess, in the NFT world. It isn't truly open. Um, and I think also, you know, people have this idea that an NFT can't the there there can only be one of them but that's still at the discretion of the artist that is just like a printmaker could then take their litho plate after they you know print an edition of 20 and say well you know what i'm just going to print another edition of 20. Um, but what that does is it devalues their work and that's the same thing that would happen with an nft artist who just decides to mint a duplicate of one of their existing singular nfts the the person who just purchased the first one is going to say well you know, they're, they're not reputable. Um, yeah, so you're, you're, you know. you're going to end up just tarnishing your reputation as, you know, an ethical person. Like Absolutely. Nobody's going to want to do business with you after, you, like, as soon as you do that and somebody finds out, it's like, oh, yeah, no, 
no, you're not, you're not worth doing business with anymore. Like, no, don't do that. So well, you know, it does come down to the integrity of the artist. I mean, mm-hmm. I was in a, a interview in Forbes magazine in 1990 and it was called, I mean, it, well, we're going back in time, but the, the title of it was, what am I offered for this floppy disc? I mean, some people are, may not even know what a floppy disc is, but you know, and one of my collectors was interviewed about it and said, what's to, you know, what's to, why would you buy a Ross Diamond? And, you know, and, and if she can make millions of these. And, and uh, he said, it comes down to trusting the artist. Cause as Davo was saying, you know, you, you could take a lithograph or make a photo of it and, and do another lithograph. And, you know, Dolly got into a lot of trouble. I mean, uh, you know, and, and um, it's something you have to think about when people are buying your work, um, you know, it's just like the galleries say that don't you, you don't want to make too much of a discrepancy between selling to your individual people and the gallery, even though there's a 50% fee, because uh, it needs to stay in some There's of- the article right there. What? <laughs> there's the article right there. I should, oh, I should my show husband. my camera. It's true. I'm not just making this up. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, magazine. I think it was 1991, Ross. Oh, 1991. That's right. I was so excited. I have to tell you, when I heard that I was in this Forbes magazine with with David Hockney and I was downtown in New York and could barely afford anything. And I went running out of my apartment and to buy every Forbes magazine I could find on every block. (laughs) And and let me just say one thing. David Hockney's art in this article with his digital art was sending many, 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 many pages of faxes to Europe that were assembled into a picture. That was his digital art. Yeah, he's pretty, he's pretty interesting, though. You know, he's he's been out there uh, innovative in that space. Um, he so. sent that to Europe. Is that funny? And that was digital art. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, we did have a question that I, I guess I missed. Um, <clears throat> yes, you can put a reserve on an auction. So, yeah, that is something that you can do. Uh, can you know more about that, De- mm-hmm. Devo? What, what does that mean? Say that again. Putting a reserve on the auction? Oh, on like, the auction. I thought you yeah. said option, and I didn't know what you... Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, t- looks like there are no current questions in the queue. Oh, I had one for Sue. Buyer. Oh, there you go. Bayer? Buyer, Bayer. Buyer, uh, Bayer. Um, I'm not sure the best way to pronounce it, but I was wondering, on your piece... Um, that animated piece, uh, was that created programmatically? And, and if it was, what, um, you know, what, what is your process? So the first time I made that type of work, I was using processing. And um, I, after doing the processing version, I found other ways of doing it. Um, because it was in processing, it was very low res because I was just taking screenshots and uh, sort of cropping it a bit and putting that out as a video. But now I use After Effects to do it because I can do it as high res as I want. Yeah. <laughs> more computer <laughs> power is always yeah. useful. Thank you, Pat. So more, having more computer power is always useful. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. They started off being a program, but now they're sort of more a video. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's funny. I, resolution I, I, isn't discussed that much, and resolution is a big deal. Yeah. I have a question for Tommy. Tommy Mintz. You, Tommy, you there? Yeah, Tommy, your your work really, for me, speaks to this in-between space that we're in these days, which kind of relates to NFTs. You know, you, you seem to capture this cost between spatial and time and uh, the physical and the intangible and the 21st century uh, in in effect, the anxiety versus hope. Uh, What are your thoughts uh, to do with your work in that area? Wow, Clive, I'm flattered that you feel that. First of all, I'd like to deflect the compliment and say, I'm flattered to be, you know, kitty corner to you in this virtual exhibition. You know, it's sort of like, wow. And your work is fantastic. And it, hey, 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 we, we don't deflect compliments here. They're freely given and freely received. <laughs> but I, I appreciate I, no, I appreciate it. Um, and um, yeah, I feel like I, I have a lot of nostalgia for now. I feel like there's a lot of um, anxiety. There's a lot of um, 
apocalyptic stories that we've absorbed about what we're experiencing and what we're heading towards. And in my photographs, I'm not so much recording what is now, but the feeling of wanting to stay in the present moment as it slips by. Hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. It does, it does, yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, it's reflected in our sense of, you know, our perception of self in digital space as well. You know, here we are, you know, engaging in this, you know, beautiful social engagement through the digital space. We also have these other structures of ourselves that we've constructed through the digital space that also, I feel like, have um, changed our sense of self in ways that we haven't completely understood. We've been taught this through fictions that we've witnessed, you know, this sort of store of movies or, you know, um, I'm thinking of um, uh, Demolition Man. Did you ever watch Demolition Man with like... Uh, that was one of my favorite films as a child. Right? <laughs> Great movie. And anyway, so there's this one scene in Demolition Man. It's, it's like, uh, you know, uh, ecotopia dystopia, right? So like everything's perfect and green and there's like a, a conference room where people are sitting around, but it's all just a bunch of screens sitting around a conference table facing each other. And they're having, you know, and that's how, and you know, and there are all these other sort of VR things are dystopian in it. But I feel like, you know, we're now heading towards in ways that, you know, uh, that we've incorporated into our, our minds more than our actual sort of physical um, lives. You know, we just sort of have this mental picture that is fractured, you know, digitally. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and we exist so much responding to the digital stimulus that, you know, we're, we're not sort of holding on to anything anymore in a way that I think has, you know, a significant um, cultural shift that we've undergone, you know, that, that I feel like I'm trying to explore. I think so. Do, do you think that uh, Taco Bell's going to win the uh, the food, fast food wars then? <laughs> Sorry. You know, uh, I, I like Chipotle, so I won't know. Oh, oh no. All right, back to you, Clive. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, it's okay. I was, uh, I think your work captures that. Uh, I also have a question for Giovanna. Are you still there, Giovanna? Your camera's off. I don't know if you're still there. Anyway, uh, if you come back, uh, yeah, there you are, maybe. Oh, hi. Hi there. Yeah, I didn't mean to shock you there. No, tell like. Okay, yeah, because uh, actually, uh, I just had my uh, second dose of Modora. Oh. Uh, I, I have a vaccine this afternoon, so I feel a little dizzy. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no problem. No, I like the, uh, yeah. <laughs> I like the fact your work has, um, has, has love incorporated into it, is romantic love. Uh, um, that's kind of connects to what Tommy's talking about in the anxiety today. There's also hope and love, too, that goes along with the same package of possibilities. Uh, why did you focus on on love uh, in in your work in this piece? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Too complicated a question, maybe I don't know. Uh, can, can you, yeah. Uh, can you type in? Uh... That's okay. That's okay. I'll just say I like your work. Okay. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I have a little headache and fever somehow right now. <laughs> Just cannot concentrate and I have to use an uh, ice bag. I, yeah, I feel take care of <laughs> Go ahead, Demo and, and, uh, and Colin. I, I've got nothing at the moment. How about you, Colin? Uh, yeah, actually, I would like to um, ask, ask you, Clive, um, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what's going on with, in your piece and, and sort of like the, the the floating spheres and the photographic background. Like, can you can you speak to the the narrative or maybe some of the ideas behind the work at all? Uh, the background image is significant for me. It, I think it's in the write up that. It's one of the first color photos, the earliest color photos that still exists when they were uh, inventing that. He was actually a friend of the Melies brothers who also invented cinema along with the Edison invention as well. So it has this interesting resonance that way. It's a French mountain. It's a, it's a damaged photo. So you see the physicality of the photo 
And then from there, I mean, the, the mountain is kind of a symbol of physicality, but it's all been dissolved into math. In fact, we're just looking at a representation made up of, you know, uh, of math. And, uh, and then the floating spheres in front of that are part of my own long-term fascination of uh, randomized movement that seems to, uh, I hope, evoke the sense of, um, of movement in time and physical space at the same time. So that's part of my personal fascination. But it also, uh, what connects, to, uh, connects, it all connects to the, my general long-term interest in multi-platform art making. So NFTs are a very interesting uh, new development in that. To make something that is just digital, uh, instead of the prints I've been making for years and the videos and the films before that, uh, this is a very interesting new development, a new, a new platform that is remaining digital and is intended to be so. You know, that, that's a quite interesting territory. Yeah, I definitely, I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, the, the drawings that I based my NFTs on, I originally called them metagraphs. And this is back in like 99 when I was making these drawings because um, uh, like at the time, prior to getting involved in vector-based work, I did everything in Photoshop. And then I learned about vector-based work, how every line and curve and everything is defined mathematically. You can actually open the file up in a text editor and, and read it. And at that time there were EPS files. Now they're usually like, you know, I, save them out as AI files or PDF files, but you can still look at the code, you know, and I always thought that the, um, the physical object, like if I print it large format on canvas or edition on a paper, that's really not the art. That's just like a manifestation of the art, which is the, the code, you know? So I think that now with, with NFTs, um, the actual digital object can, can be the art and it's, it's, it's validated as such. And, 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 and integrated into sort of our commercial system now in a way that it never could have been before, which I think is, is really interesting, you know, and, um, and definitely Clive, like that whole idea of randomness also like that resonates with me because as someone who's sort of a geeky coder type person, you know, I, I believe that there is no such thing really. Like we haven't been able to develop a true uh, randomization routine or algorithm, you know, everything that humans have come up with so far at some point repeats, you know, so that kind of begs the philosophical question, you know, is randomness something that's just a construct, you know, or does it really exist? Yeah, you know, exactly. My, my nephew corrected me once quite uh, sternly at Christmas dinner about the fact that it's really pseudo random, not random. And he, he's right, of course, we just shorten it to random. You know, the, the, the true randomness uh, isn't actually possible. Eventually there'll be a repetition. The fact is, though, that it would take a machine to sit in front of some of the works I made. Uh, it, it would take a machine to sit there for a few months to see the repetition. So in practice, I can call it random, not pseudo random. And that's what I said to him in the middle of Christmas dinner with the rest of my family. So anyway. <laughs> right. Sounds like a wonderful Christmas conversation. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I quickly cut it off there because the rest of the family was just uh, had no idea what we're talking about. But the uh, no, no, but what? This is artist to artist uh, questions right now would be a good thing to for somebody you know who else has a question for another artist. Anybody? <laughs> I guess we maybe we're brain dead, but I know I'd probably have a million of them, um, but uh, not coming to mind at the moment. So there's a lot to think about with this whole NFT space. Would we be opposed to be potentially restreaming or um, the the exhibition really quick so that we can have a quick flyover of everything that's in there? Maybe rejog some people's memory if they might have a question idea. before. Yeah, I would appreciate yeah. it. Idea. Halfway Absolutely. Through. All right. Share it up. <laughs> All right, give me one second. Well, you know, that's one thing to think about time and space and everything's altered in, in this space. You know, in a gallery and when you go to Chelsea and it's six to eight opening, you go in and you stay and and rarely will someone stay two hours uh, unless they want to just, you know, drink more wine or something, you know. Uh, but it's, um, even though I'm glad it wasn't, I mean, I thought it was wonderful and I'm glad we have this much time, but it's something to think about actually. Um, the time you have in, a, in a, an opening online. It's, it's, a, it's a whole different kind of paradigm, a little bit. <laughs> 
Well, the phenomenon of recording it too, I think it's like, you know, a whole different sort of animal that, you know, we're all sort of co-creating, which I think is interesting, you know? Yeah. Sorry, I have my, my moderation set up <laughs> that to put away. Okay. All right, now we are back in the exhibition. Uh, do we want to do a guided tour? Or just go through the list? Maybe we guided could tour, please. speak up. Who, who wants to talk about a particular work? Yeah, I was having some issues with the guided tour. I was getting, uh, oh, no, it's coming. I guess it just takes a minute for it to start streaming. Yeah, that's probably it. Or if anyone sees, you know, if any of the artists in here see their work pop up and want to say anything about the piece um, and give a little, uh, you know, shout out and let us know where you're, where you're dialing in from, that'd be cool too. What I like about that last piece and someone else, I think it was Clive commented on it, um, Tommy's piece, is that, I mean, there's a beauty to the uh the the chaos you know i mean that's one thing that always intrigues me in, in art whether it's uh digital or, or or you know uh cave man art or whatever and cave women let me say no but just that that there's a paradox going on. i mean there's a beauty to it and a and a um kind of glitch factor or something um and disruption that's truthful but there, there's i don't know what is beauty it's like a, a friend and i once said what is beauty? It's a thing that makes you go, mm, you know, I mean, sometimes there are no answers for that exactly. But I think it works in that way. Almost deconstructionist. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not boring. That's, that's, uh... <laughs> yeah, no, it's an interesting time to be photographing too. There's a lot of change going on in our physical space, you know, that I feel like we're, we're almost not aware of as we're all looking at our screens so often and then poof, you know, the, you, I don't know, also this whole COVID year, you know, you, we, we return to spaces that we haven't been in a year and, and, and there's dramatic changes that have happened. So it's an interesting time to be photographing. And I do think the digital photograph is an interesting sort of um, way of generating data. You know, we're talking about randomness and the sort of um, maybe patterns that you might feel like you're coalescing in the randomness. And um, the digital photograph provides a lot of data, you know, that's, that's fairly, you know, when you think about it, random, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of change going on. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, it's a very interesting thing to be thinking about, really, that you're talking about um, sort of in, in that idea of random. I feel, I feel like it's weird that this uh, biological thing, this this virus has slingshot technology into this amazing new kind of realm. There's this weird kind of interplay between the biological and the technological. I think it's quite fascinating. Yeah, that animated series that you have, um, that you've been showing on your, your Instagram feed is totally mind blowing. I feel like it kind of addresses that in some way. Um, yeah, yeah. The one that's sort of very sci-fi feeling but I started thinking you know during this pandemic that it's almost preparing humans for space travel because we're like yeah. in our little pods and we have everything we need in their little pod and like the people that can survive that way without cracking up you know are going to be able to survive space flight or something like that yeah it's kind of amazing and creepy at the same time <laughs> and the piece by Clive too has uh, that's uh, just thinking looking at it it has to me like a it has a monumentality, but ephemerality at the same time. Um. Yeah, good. And I hope, uh, I hope, uh, you know, the biological and creepiness combination as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I wanted, yeah, I think it's you know, photographs I, of glaciers that, that have receded, you know, and sort of bubbling off of that, that epoch, you know, and as we ent enter the Anthropocene. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, the, and the camera really, you know, it's interesting to sort of look in at the pixels, if you will, of, of this beautiful old picture that you chose, Clyde, and see the amount of detail 
that that's there that you know you really have to play with on the board. I, I found this photo on a, a French uh, photo archive, a public library archive in the south of France. And it was part of what I was doing at the time, searching the internet for mountains. Because they really, in a, in a weird, ironic way, go back to the beginning of the internet where mountains were, well, digital culture in a way. Because it wasn't really the internet, it was computers had uh, screensavers with mountains on them right from the beginning. And then there were screensaver websites where you could download a mountain image to be repeated on your computer. And so they, they really uh, are part of the internet, that physical. Like an echo from the past. It's, yeah. it's great. Let me go. Let me know if I'm going too fast or anything like that. I was trying to linger on the uh, onto the piece that we were currently talking about. <laughs> You're doing good. Well, thank you. Hockney's iPad drawings. Or yep. Paintings. Yeah. Whoops. Technology is sometimes finicky, by the way. Are, are you still there, Alicia? Not anymore? Okay. Now, I do wish I had some sort of ambient music in the background to go with this, but uh, fortunately, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I could put on some classical music for you guys if you want. I think that might be fitting, maybe. Andy, can, I, Andy, can you tell us about the bird sounds, bird song that, re that relates to this image, if, that, if I'm getting that right? Is that correct? Yeah, I, I see um, sounds in my imagination, I guess. Um, and this is a fluctuation of parrot sounds um, and what it would look like um, in my imagination. Um, I took photos of these parrots and recorded sounds up in um, Karanda in uh, Queensland in Australia um, a few years back. Um, and yeah, like, I guess seeing sound is something that's very personal to um, individual people, I guess, you know, there's, and it's probably has a lot to do with memory as well. And what you associate with memories too would, would taint like particular things too. Like, um, yeah, it's interesting. I will say that every time I go over it, I'm noticing a new detail that I didn't pick up the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot in there. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really nice. I really like the space. Yeah, thanks. Glad you like. Yeah, it's beautiful. There's some fractals in there too. Yeah, um, from a fractal program, it's kind of mixed in and used like paint kind of thing. I like what you've done here, Andy. Um, being on the other side the continent with you um these parrots they cracked me up because i see them here <laughs> yeah. they wake you up in the morning I, I don't know if you guys know but these things they just squawk like you would not believe in the morning. Wow. they're very intelligent too aren't they oh, yeah. Yeah, tell me about it. they know when they're irritating you <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> Well, something we haven't talked about as much today, uh, but maybe we've mentioned in um, tech expressionism salons, but, you know, kind of the macro and micro of, of uh, digital, how you, you know, the layering and layering and now it's how you can just go further and deeper and deeper and deeper um, into a space. Like, I love how close Davo is getting into his own piece right here where we can see the, it's just endless. And yet another friend of mine, it always brings up interesting discussions. Another friend of mine who used to write for Smithsonian said, well, Roz, when you look at a great oil painting, you go into the crust of an oil painting. <laughs> and it's like, and I went, did you have to say, I mean, did you, but I love it because there wasn't, a, a, there was something about that that's true that 
tons and tons, but you can't lift up that oil painting and go inside it. And now with these pieces, well, at least some of them, you can do that, but it's a, it's a different kind of a 2D illusionary space that is just filled to the maximum. I mean, there's, it's endless. Um, I don't want to over talk on a piece because maybe it's not making sense with the particular piece because they're all different ways to look at these works. <laughs> so Davo, um, you mind yeah. jumping back to your piece real quick? Yeah, yeah sure. You know, wanted to, to, to hear from you a little bit about, you know, um, I know that you said it related um, in the description anyway to um, Basquiat and, and his work that I guess was also an untitled piece or yeah um it was literally called untitled head that that's what it was it was just the head um one of his more famous pieces because i believe that's the one that sold for like a cool two million or something like that um and it was like the first time that a piece had been sold like that for a living artist i think that was the piece i cannot remember quite certain but it was it was one of one of his um one of the untitled ones um, but this one, um, I, I, I've been studying a lot of Basquiat over the past year or so, <laughs> if uh, some of you didn't know. And um, a lot of my early work that I was doing was kind of just exploring my own style. And this is one of the very few times that I actually like directly referenced um, an artist that came before pretty much. And I chose this one and um because there was a level of i guess primalcy that resonated with me that i too wanted to kind of uh, replicate but i also kind of wanted to make it my own so you can still see that it's like a skull structure or a face structure here there's a nose and eye here and teeth and whatever um but there's one thing that I added to it that is kind of a very much a me thing, and that's this eye on the right here. Um, all of my artwork, the, uh, well, not all of them, sorry. There's a good chunk of my artwork that features an eye styled very similar to like this, almost always in white. Um, it'll either appear floating or um, be prominently featured somewhere on the artwork. And it's kind of similar to Basquiat's crown for me because Basquiat's crown represented like three facets of himself, like the, his lineage, um, his culture and all that good stuff. And with this though, with mine, um, I kind of call it my eye of truth. It is um, kind of a takeoff of the eye of Horus actually, but always kind of turned this way instead of being on its side like a typical eye. And it's for, not only as it like, for me is like functioning as the artwork, you're, you're, you're viewing the, the artwork, but the eye itself is also kind of looking at you. So it's almost like a lens for the artwork itself to gaze back at the viewer. And it also carries the connotation of like protection and, you know, being safe, um, that kind of thing. They're always watching. Cool. So yeah. that's amazing. So it's a hectic. It is very hectic. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's, it's quite powerful. Really Thank more, you. Hey, Davo, um, since Roz and Nagin are both here, do you think we could just jump to their piece? Yeah. Because um, maybe, you know, it would Yeah, I just realized we're, to, um, we're, we're on, we're low on time. time. Yeah, um, list of artworks. Let me go down to, do, 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 where is it at? I feel like I passed it. Did I pass it? No? Uh, no. Uh, there it is. There Found it. it. Now, I will say that Nagin just wrote me on the chat and said, Roz, do you realize it's four o'clock in Iran? And she goes, <laughs> I look like I'm asleep. I mean, <laughs> I love that she's there. And if she wants to say something, she, she did say, I'm glad you're speaking because I, I'm pretty tired. But um, Nagin, if you would like to say something, that'd be great. Otherwise I can speak to it or... Are you, you still awake? <laughs> yes. Um, I can. Um... Uh, 
Someone asked about the Farsi. Uh, you know, there's Farsi language in this where I went back yeah. and forth with, with Nagin and said, oh, could you please give me um, the word Dorothy in, um, in Farsi? And so we incorporated different languages here. Um, I don't want to interrupt you, though, if you're going to say something. Uh, is that the Constitution in the upper left corner? We yes. People, yeah, we the people. Yep. Thanks, James. That's in there. <laughs> Um, speaking of how much you can put in one piece. And then you can also see uh, the, the silhouette of Tehran actually at the top in the black. That's turned upside mm -hmm. down, but see that silhouette? And then there's a silhouette of New York City in the bottom left. Nagin, do you maybe want to say something about how it started with the collab, um, but I also, you know, maybe Colin wants to talk to his piece too, or, or someone else, but um, I know you started this because of music from a composer, right? Yes, uh, it was a music about uh, actually um, making peace with life and uh, kind of like leaving where you are, either by body or by soul. So to me, it was also a kind of um, immigration by soul or body. So like people could stay where they are and they live somewhere else or they could actually move somewhere else. But also in digital world, it's like we live all over these places, different places, but sometimes like, how you see the Farsi words, you can see them and have them and even get familiar to them, but maybe you cannot really understand them. So it's also with the culture, you don't have um, the cultural background of it. So sometimes um, you, you think you know things, but because you don't know about the background and all the history behind it, you actually have your own idea of that. So it's like, even if you immigrate to another country, actually you are living in another country than they actually live in there. <laughs> so it's also about your own country too. I mean, if you don't live with your own culture and if you don't read about history, if you don't know much about it, so sometimes you live somewhere you think differently than it really is. So I think uh, also that was a part of collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, that's nice. Dabo uh, is that yours? So that so is Roz, mine. Yes. Roz. Cool. <laughs> so you and. Uh, um, and again, you guys collaborated on this, correct? Yes. What, how did that come about? What was the process? Well, I mean, what, what made you two decide to do it um, in the first place? It came out of the Texpressionism Salon um, that, that we were, we've been attending, both of us, for, for some months now. And, and uh, Davo and Colin came up, I think, with, or maybe it was Davo who came up with the concept for a uh, collaborative, uh, curating a collaborative show. And some of us, I don't normally collaborate that much. And yet I find as I do more digital work, of course I work with a team, but in this case, mm -hmm. I just thought, yeah, I put it out there and he um, grouped us with certain people and, and I got Nagin and it worked out beautifully. I mean, we really had a, a real simpatico and we even got on a Zoom together to, to find out more about each other as we went into it. But it was a really exciting, Collaboration. Yeah, it's cool. During COVID. <laughs> you know? yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Thank Thanks. You. And there will definitely yeah, on, be more on, to come. On the Texpressionism site, if you go into the exhibition section, the collab show is up there still. So you can see all the collaborations. It was um, four uh, pairings of two artists each. And um, each pairing passed digital files back and forth. And then we put them up. That was our, actually our first show that we did as a group. Um, and that was Davo's idea to, to put that together. So that was real cool. Yeah, that was um, a nicely curated show as well. Cool. Thank you. Well, guys, it's 
Patrick Hill here. It's about that time. It's eight o'clock. It is about that time. Probably. And I did not get through all of these like I had uh, planned on. Are, are there more questions or oh, oh, you're still just, oh, just going through? I was wondering if Patrick is still on online. Oh. I think uh, he left. I think he said he had to sign yeah, off. Yeah. Yeah. I think Patrick took off. Yeah. I'll tell him next time. Yeah. I love his work. So absolutely. Um all right. Well, I guess we'll uh, close the recording down. Um, and uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, uh, guys and gals. Thanks for showing up and um, being here to participate in this event. It's going to be um, at some point um, soon uh, published to our YouTube channel. And um, you can get to that through techexpressionism.com down in the site footer. Um, and then uh, We'll probably at some point establish, you know, a, a separate playlist for uh, for openings because I think this worked out pretty pretty well. So um, everyone Thanks. have a have a great night. Have yeah. A, Vince Balter. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thank you for coming. Bye. Thank All you. Right. Bye. Good night.